Welcome to the Just Ingredients Podcast. I'm Cara Lynn, and here we talk all things nourishing to the mind, body, and soul. This is a place where you can find just good ingredients to life. When thinking about your journey towards better health, do you think about water? It's no secret. We know how important it is to drink water, but we often forget to consider the quality and safety of the water we are drinking every day. Research shows that despite where you live, there is a high likelihood your tap water may not be as clean and safe as you think. Clearly Filtered is on a mission to help you and your family stay hydrated, healthy, and safe by providing the best filtered water products on the market today. Clearly Filtered makes insanely powerful water filters that completely blow the competitors out of the water. Clearly Filtered is independently tested and certified to remove over 272 harmful chemicals and toxins found in our drinking water today. They are easy to work with, family-owned, made in the USA, and passionate about trying to help provide us with clean and safe water every day. I love that Clearly Filtered is affordable compared to many other untested alternatives has portable filtered water products to take on the go, and helps you stay safe and hydrated everywhere. Clearly filtered products are also eco-friendly and can significantly reduce plastic and water waste through their patented filtered technology. Join the tens of thousands of new customers today who have joined Clearly Filtered in the quest for better health through clean and safe water. Go to clearlyfiltered.com and use the code JUSTINGREDIENTS to save 15% off your order today. Dr. Anna Maria Temple is a best-selling author, mother of three, an award-winning speaker at Harvard Club of Boston, and has had over 100 TV, news, and podcast appearances. From 2016 to 2017, she lived and worked in the New Zealand medical system, where she started putting functional medicine into practice. In her 22-year career, she has treated over 36,000 patients in person and hundreds via online courses. Her passion is to inspire, educate, and empower parents to revamp their family's health and prevent children from developing chronic disease. You guys, today I am so excited to have Dr. Anna Maria Temple here again, actually, for the second time, her first um, podcast episode with me. If you haven't listened to it, it is amazing. So I asked her to come back again, and we're going to talk about different things with children. But first of all, thank you, Dr. Anna Maria Temple, for coming again. I am so excited to be here. I was so pumped about new topics for a new season so we can get everybody staying well during cold and flu. Yes, exactly. So I love your background story. So will you just share with my listeners, in case they haven't heard the first episode, just how you got started practicing the way that you do? Sure. I'm actually from Romania and I grew up under communism and we moved to the United States in 1984 without speaking any English. So I started middle school in sixth grade without knowing any English, which when my children complained about middle school, I was like, yeah, try doing this in French. So, and anyway, my vision was to be a doctor and I, you know, went to med school, became a doctor. Well, in 2007, after being in medicine for about five years, Uh, And having gone to a traditional medical school and residency, I had three children at that time. And my children were two, four, and six, and they were full of chronic disease, recurrent ear infections, recurrent croup, cold, sinus, seasonal allergies, constipation, eczema, asthma, allergies, and even ADHD. In fact, my little guy was so affected by seasonal allergies that he could not go out for an Easter egg hunt without his eyes swelling shut, tears streaming down his face and his body covered in hives. Wow. So one day I took him to the doctor and I was like, okay, there's got to be an answer besides more medications. It can't be that my kids are destined to travel with a suitcase of medications anytime we're leaving the house. And the answers were not satisfactory. It was you know, for the little one, we have run out of allergy medicines. And I quote, the only thing left is allergy shots. He was two years old. Well, and you still hear that today. And we're still talking about the same thing today. And my daughter 
They're like, well, she could just take her daily inhaled steroids will keep her asthma under control and daily topical steroids will keep her eczema under control. She will take Zyrtec or Claritin to keep her allergies, which then will keep her eczema and asthma under control. And she will eventually outgrow her ear infections and croup. And here's some Miralax for a constipation. And then by the time we got to my, my middle child, who was so full of snot and boogers that there's not enough tissues in Costco. You know, I've, I was pondering, I'm like, these days, he wouldn't even be allowed of the house with the way <laughs> our society is going on today, right? And, you know, he had ADHD. I, I stopped listening at that point because I wasn't getting the answers I was looking for, which is like, why are my children so sick? I am a pediatrician. How can this happen? And... It was that when I walked out of the office that day, it was when the mama warrior took over and the mama warrior was like, hold up. These dancers are not okay. We got to figure something else to do. And my doctor self was like, I have no idea what else to do except medications. And my mama self was like, we will figure something out. I don't know what it is, but this is not the answer. And it was a week later, I went to my children's school there was a nutritionist who gave a talk and it was on a Tuesday morning when I was freezing my tushy off in a first grade desk <laughs> and uh, the fog lifted and I realized the issue with my children's chronic disease. All that she talked about was sugar. And I looked at myself and I was like, huh, they do eat a strawberry at lunch and they do have broccoli at dinner. I guess that's not, you know, a well-balanced diet like I thought. So I went home and I throw away the Lucky Charms and the Cheetos and the Gatorade and the uh, mac and cheese and the chicken nuggets and the Pop-Tarts, you name it, we had it. And that's when I began to really see what I was feeding my children. And without knowing much, because 2007, I don't even think Google was really cranking by then. I just decided I'm going to get rid of garbage and I'm going to give my children food at every meal. And we started slowly and I'll, but, but. When I threw away all that food, I became an outcast in my family. <laughs> my husband oh, thought I lost my mind. He was like, why are you throwing away perfectly good food? My family, you know, wanted to disown me. My friends were like, you literally lost it. And then my colleagues were like, well, where's the medical evidence? And I was like, I don't know where the medical evidence is, but it can be wrong to get rid of garbage and eat more fruits and vegetables. Anyway, over the next five years, as all warrior mamas know, you just persevere and you go against the naysayers. And over the next five years, my kids stopped needing antibiotics. They stopped needing Miralax. They um, did not require any more steroids. Their eczema got better, asthma got better, seasonal allergies. We never needed ADHD medicines or allergy shots. And in 2016, we moved to New Zealand. We were nine years into the journey. We had no doctors, no medical insurance, no medications. And my children thrived and climbed the highest mountains and bungee jumped off the tallest bridges. And I realized what a beautiful thing is to heal your children from chronic disease and be able to live life fully. What amazes me with that story is that you were a pediatrician, but yet didn't know how to help your children. I did not know because in medical school, and I went to a fabulous medical school, and I'm not bashing medical schools, and I'm not bashing doctors, but I was taught about this is the illness and this is the medication you take. We are taught, oh yes, healthy eating and exercise are good for the body, but no one teaches you how to teach children, how to teach adults, how to eat well. No one teaches us like what nutrition really is, except like the food label, oh, does it have enough grams of protein and sugar and salt? And that's about it. No one teaches you how to convince your family to put down screens, how to go outside more, how to sleep better, how to talk to your patients like that, or how to explore natural options for common things. And that's why we're here today, because I feel there was a disservice. And I, I feel that I did a disservice to my patients for you know 15 years when I was in traditional practice, because I didn't know all the other natural options besides traditional medicines. Well, I love that you saw a problem and went and figured something out and went and did the research and the trying it out on your kids, things like that. And so I love what you teach today. I love how you educate on social media. And so I'm going to pick your brain about winter time. We're approaching winter time right now. And you always hear about the flu and cold season. So I'm curious why it's the flu and cold season. And do kids really get more sick? Well, I should say sick more often in the wintertime. 
Yeah, you know, that's the question, the age old question. Everyone's like, why? What's happening? Why is it now? Is it the families? Is because we're gathering? Well, we know we have cold air. So cold air puts people indoors and indoors. We know we're transmitting more goodies back and forth. But the actual super secret ingredient is really humidity. So in the wintertime, we have less humidity, especially in the northern states and the northern countries. Then in the summertime, I live in the south. In the south, in the summer, it's humid and, and hot. And in the winter is very dry. And there's a fabulous scientist actually from Harvard. She practiced medicine for 25 years. And then as you do, she decided to get another degree in engineering and architecture, of course, at Stanford. And then she started because she was like, there's something more to the way we transmit viruses and illnesses in the wintertime. It can't just be winter. It can't just be cold. And humidity was what the magic ingredient is that she found. So in a dry environment, the viruses that were spreading to one another actually stick better inside our nose. So a dry nose will, the viruses stick to a dry mucous membrane inside our nose, in our eyes, and inside our mouth. When everything is moisturized, the viruses have a tougher time adhering, which is sticking to and invading the body. And fun, interesting research that was done will show that in people that had adequate humidity decreased flu transmission by 77%. That is an insane number. They went to hospitals, they went to the ORs where, and I know my husband is a surgeon and in the ORs it's dry and it's really cold. And you know, they're always worried about secondary infections. And then in the hospitals, how many patients go and they're like, oh my gosh, I went with one thing and I came out with another thing. And of course, hand washing is a problem because as we learned during the pandemic is only 50% of healthcare workers wash their hands regularly. That's just disgusting. Oh, wow. So that's problem number one. And number two, and even more important than hand washing was air humidity because inside the hospitals, the air is so super dry. And when they brought in humidity, it decreased the transmission of infections. And then they took the study further and Mayo Clinic went to preschools and they did humidifying in half the preschool classes and no humidifiers in other preschool classes. The classes that had humidifier had 60% less absenteeism from cold and flu symptoms. Wow, that is fascinating. So do you recommend then that everybody have a humidifier in their house or like in their kids' bedrooms? I recommend that you get an actually humidity monitor because too much humidity can lead to mold. And as I said, I live in the South and humidity can be a big issue. So the humidity there's, you could get an accurate uh, humidity monitor, it's like $10 and have that in your house and see where your humidity is. You're shooting for between 40% and 58%. Mold doesn't start growing until about 60%. So 40 to 58 is a safe window to help reduce cold and flu and not grow mold. So I would start with a humidity monitor and then I would get a humidifier if you're not in the target range. Oh, that's so interesting. I actually am really curious to know what the humidity is um, in my home because in Utah, actually, it's very, very dry. So yeah, I'm really interested to see that. So let's say we don't have enough humidity and we need a humidifier. Are there certain ones you recommend or any humidifier is a good option? Generally speaking, there's a lot of humidifiers on the market. Be careful because some of them grow mold. One of the things that I put in, um, I have a holistic pediatric manual. What I have in there is I have five humidifiers that were tested actually by Good Housekeeping. So that's another place you can just jump right now and after this podcast and look at good housekeeping top five humidifier recommendations because they look for sound for mold for cleaning um, good things and I, I keep I do that as well into in my holistic pediatric manual so it, there are about five of them that are just well tested and fabulous but you really if you watch the mold and cleaning you can get away with pretty much any of them okay good to know let's talk about the flu with kids is there a way that we can help prevent the flu in children Flu is coming, <laughs> folks. It's already been in North Carolina. We already had documented cases of flu. And the number one thing is if you're sick, what we've learned, I'm hoping that what we've learned, we continue learning. If you're sick and feeling bad, please stay home and please keep your children home. I don't mean like a little cold. What, let's talk about what the flu looks like because now we're so confused. Like, what do I have the flu? Do I have other viral illnesses? What is the thing? Right. Flu is a Mack truck that runs you over and you have this feeling that you literally just got hit by a truck 
and you usually have fevers of like 102 to 104. You have glassy eyes and your body hurts. You may start with runny nose and congestion. Now for COVID, you have that sore throat and you may have that fatigue. For flu is your body hurts really bad and the fever is very, it's pretty distinct. When people, when I see somebody with flu, I'm like, that's flu. I don't even need a test because there's a look to flu. Mm -hmm. And so the high fevers, and usually a lot of the high fevers last for several days, sometimes three to five days, sometimes up to 10 days with a lot of cough and congestion and such. So you want to stay home if you, especially if you have a fever, probably the biggest thing that I see in pediatrics is that parents will give a fever reducer in the middle of the night, about three o'clock in the morning, the child wakes up in the morning and they're feeling fine and they don't have a fever. So they get sent to daycare, preschool or school thinking that they're good. And then at about nine or 10 a.m., the parent gets a call, the child has a fever. Now they've gone to school, infected half their classroom. Now we've spread flu like it's going out of style. So if your child is sick, do not send them to school if you've had to use a fever reducer in within 24 hours. Okay, that's good to know. That's a good rule of thumb. Now, if they're so at 24 hours, you have to be fever free without a fever reducer. Okay, so once they have the flu, what are some natural ways to help them with the flu or to treat the flu? One of my favorites that is easy to get around anyone and local as best is elderberry syrup. We've shown elderberry syrup that was actually done in head to head clinical trials um, with Tamiflu and other over the counter stuff. And elderberry showed to decrease symptoms of flu by about two to three days and also the duration of symptoms. Before you even go for the elderberry, one of the things I recommend is that we don't treat fever. And a lot of people are going to be like, what? I know everybody saying? wants to give that Motrin to help their child out, to bring it down. Right. And it's because we don't want to see our children in pain, right? As parents, like the worst thing to happen for us is our children in pain. But let's talk about what happens. So when the body gets invaded by flu or another virus, our body says, hold up wait a minute, I'm under attack. The virus has to use our body as a photocopy machine because the virus cannot live on its own. It could live on a surface for a few hours, et cetera, but it cannot live for a long time. It needs our body to replicate itself. So for simplicity purposes, the virus comes in with its 50 friends, they invade our body because we have dry mucous membranes and they use our body as a photocopy machine to make lots of copies of themselves. Well, when our body senses that, it says, oh, I don't think so. And it raises the temperature to 102, 103, 104. For. When it raises a the thermostat and we have a fever, the photocopy machine stops. So the virus can no longer replicate itself. The other thing that happens is our white blood cells go into massive production. The heat from the body makes the white blood cells churn out faster and more efficient and get to the source of infection with quicker speed. When we take, so when that happens, if we don't do the fever, we, we don't take any medicines, the photocopy machine is stopped. The virus maybe replicated itself and has 200 copies. Now the body has made thousands of white blood cells. So the thousands are able to beat the viral particles down. And within two to three days, you can be done with flu. However, when we do a fever reducer, even the natural ones, when we reduce our body's temperature, we can decrease the immune system from working and we turn on the photocopy machine. So let's say we choose to do Motrin around the clock every six hours, and we're gonna talk about our fears in a second. What happens is the photocopy machine is going, now the virus is making millions and billions of particles, and the, our immune system is slow and pokey and is not able to churn out as many white blood cells as it when it had a fever. So now the illness lasts days, weeks. Some people are sick after flu for three to four weeks. So do all that you can to not treat a fever. This is in neurologically normal children and also kids that don't have cardiovascular issues or not post-surgery or something like that. We're talking about children that don't have chronic illness in those from heart and brain. And if you let the fever do its thing, you're going to get over the illness quicker. I do say that at nighttime, if the child cannot sleep because they're too achy, they're too crabby, everything hurts and they cannot sleep. I do do fever reducers at night. So they have a good night's sleep. So the immune system could do its thing. But other than that, if they're not in danger of dehydration, do best you can with supportive care 
and not give fever reducers to let your body, the, your child's body knows what to do. Our human body knows how to fight a virus. We humans interfere out of fear. I love how you just explained that because that was a great analogy. And so many parents give the fever reducers. They think that's the first thing they're supposed to do. But I do have a question for you because some pediatricians say, well, at a certain temperature, make sure you give the fever reducers. So is that not true? Is there a magical number that we're supposed to give a fever reducer at? It's one of my favorite questions. You know, a lot of times I tell my patient, my families, I'm always like, don't look at the thermometer, look at the child. Thermometer's piece of the puzzle is just information. It's not the diagnosis. So the, the temperature goes, okay, they're 104, they're hot. But you look at your youngster and they're just playing quietly. They are fine. Well, you could look at the temperature and it's a 101 and your child's laying around, can't even move, can't drink. It looks like they're about to get dehydrated. That's more significant, but the child looks sicker, not the number. The other thing is that the temperature comes from our body. Our body sets a 104, 105, or 102, whatever. The brain is not going to set a temperature that it's going to harm itself. It doesn't make sense that our human body is going to damage its own self in order to protect itself. When you hear about brain damage from high temperatures is those are from outside sources, kids that are left in a car in the summer. That's when the temperature goes up and you have brain damage. But a child that is neurologically normal is able to hold, even at 105.5, is able to maintain normalcy without sustaining damage. The other fear parents have is, oh my gosh, but if I let the fever go, they're going to have a febrile seizure. Febrile seizures happen despite Tylenol and Motrin given around the clock or every three hours. Febrile seizures happen. It's the rate of rise, not the number on the thermometer. So if your child goes from 97.3 to a 103 in 20 minutes, it's a really fast rise and that could lower the seizure threshold, which all of us have. It's not that your child is hanging out and then has 103 for three hours. That's not when febrile seizures happen. Okay. That's good to know. So some pediatricians will say like, get a cool rag, you know, put the cool washcloth on their forehead, things like that. So should we not be doing that either? I'm okay with that because that makes you feel a little comfortable. I'm okay with a temperature because if you, a cool washcloth is not going to take you from 104 to 99. It'll take you from 104 to 103.5. So it's still, you know what I mean? It's not like a huge thing. I'm cool with lukewarm baths too that have Epsom salt because Epsom salt has magnesium. Magnesium helps the achy, sore muscles. And that's a really, and again, you're not going to be sitting in the tub to get to 99 degrees. You're just going to lower the temperature by maybe one or two degrees. So you're still going to be febrile and the immune system is still going to be cranking. Okay, so do you have any other tips for parents that are dealing with the flu in their home? Yeah, so another thing that parents get panicked about was when the children are laying around and not playing. When we're sick for any viral illness, the body doesn't want to use its energy for playing. The body wants the energy for healing, which means that it's trying to make us lay down and sleep so it could heal. Also, another fear is, well, they're not eating. When you're sick with flu, you don't want to eat, and that is fine. Your child is not going to start from 48 hours of not eating. They just need a lot of fluids. Again, when you eat, you use a lot of energy for eating rather than fighting the illness. So be okay with them lying around, being pokey, not wanting to play, and not wanting to eat as long as they're staying well hydrated. So we want to watch the fever as number one. Elderberry syrup is number two. And I do love oscillococcinum and do not make me spell that. That <laughs> is a, that is a homeopathic uh, supplement that is from by a company called Boyron. And they have done it uh, again, head to head comparison with Tamiflu. And they've shown a reduction in fever duration symptoms uh, as compared to Tamiflu. And the other beautiful part is you don't have the side effects of Tamiflu, which include vomiting, uh, nausea, visions, nightmares. Uh, in my patient population of pediatrics, kids have a lot of side effects from Tamiflu, not to mention that in, in adults, it can actually even cause a lot of brain inflammation. Okay. So good to know. And I love both of those supplements. And I always tell parents like have them on hand because you never know when the flu is going to hit. And so you want to give that elderberry like right when they're not feeling well. And so totally. Yeah. And you want to do it every three hours. So I'm always like an elderberry is good to have it last for three months in your fridge and the oscillococcin and the expiration date is usually two years. So 
I would have it. I always have it. I'm with you at the beginning of flu season. I have my pack ready to go. Exactly. Okay. So what is the difference? Or I should say, how can you tell the difference if it's the flu versus the cold? A cold? Because a lot of times people are like, I don't know, he has the flu or, oh, he has a cold. The flu is a big fever and body aches. And usually the, and for kids, their legs hurt really bad and their bodies hurt really bad. A cold is going to be snot and congestion. Now, can you just have a cold and be flu? Of course. But if we were going to like the majority of people with flu usually have the body aching and leg hurting and feel like they got run over by a truck feeling. Okay. So with colds come coughs usually, right? So let's talk about coughs. Do different coughs mean different things? Uh, actually, um, I'm gl- glad you said that because a lot of people do associate with different things. But let me tell you on the coughs, when a cough begins in the first couple of days. So when a viral illness, generally speaking, you're ill, the worst of the symptoms is between day three and five. So day one and two, you might have a little dry cough, maybe like a little bit of boogery nose. And then day three, it sounds like the cough escalates and it's a dry cough. It's a ha- like a comes and like continuously goes and then it gets worse and then it starts at night. So this is when parents panic. And then whenever you start panic, I want you to look at the calendar. What day are you in between day three and five? Cause you're in the worst of it right now. It doesn't mean that something horrible is happening. It means that this is the time when the infection and the immune system are going head to head. The dry cough then turns into a wet cough about day four through five. And that wet cough can sound like they've been, the kids have been smoking like five Mm -hmm. pack years. And the parents are like, that must mean bronchitis or that must mean pneumonia. All that it means is that now finally the inflammation has decreased some and now the juiciness from the lungs can actually come out and we're actually in the healing phase of the cough rather than it's getting worse. Now it's pneumonia. So it starts out with a dry cough, turns to a wet cough, and then it goes away. The worst parts of the illness are day three through five. And usually about day five, you know, they're getting better because suddenly they start sleeping longer. Suddenly their appetite's a little is back. Suddenly they have activity. So you'll see like perkiness and usually sleep is the first thing that I usually see in my patients is my first question. I'm like, but how did they sleep last night? Like, oh, They slept great, but they still have this wet cough. I'm like, we're on the way to healing. You're sleeping great. That cough may go on for 10 to 14 days in some kids, three weeks before it completely gets out of the system. But that doesn't mean something horrible is happening. That just means that's how long the body is taking to get rid of this situation. So I remember when I had young kids, when that wet cough would finally come at like day four, day five, that's when I'd call the pediatrician because I was so worried that that had turned into something nastier. And so I wish I had known when I had little kids that that meant healing and to just, you know, wait it out. It would be okay. Yeah. It's, and it's, I would say probably that's one of the panic things. That's the number one call I get. It's like, Oh my gosh, the cough has gotten worse. And I'm like, come in. I'm like, what day of the, you know, I go through my things and I'm like, obviously sometimes it could be something else, but that's why, you know, always worth a call. Well, how do you know it's something else? All of a sudden they've been without fever. Now the cough is really wet. Now they have spiking high fevers again. Now they feel like poop again. Now they're not eating. So now they're going downhill. That's something different. But if that cough is wet and they're sleeping better, the appetite's coming back, their activity is good. We're good to go. Okay. Good to know. And I'm sure you have some advice for those parents out there with kids having coughs. Like, what do you suggest that they give them? So in the kids that are over the age of one, I love honey. In fact, the study that showed that honey was superior to Benadryl, Dimetap, and other over-the-counter medications was done at my residency program. And I recruited patients for that study. That's irrelevant information. No, that's awesome though. (laughs) And so they showed that local honey, buckwheat, unfiltered, dark honey is superior to anything you can get over the counter. So just a teaspoon of local honey is amazing for coughs. There's now sprays in a honey format with propolis. Great for cough. I always have my little sprays on hand. My daughter the other day, she's like, why do we have six sprays in the house? I'm like one in every room. That's right. (laughs) Just in case case. you're ready. Just in case I lost count. Um, Then of course our elderberry, 
the Epsom salt bath, because salt water is actually so good for the respiratory system. If you happen to have a salt room near you is one of my favorite little tricks because going into a salt room or a salt pad, hanging out there for about 30, 40 minutes is like going to the beach and inhaling the salt air is so cleansing and anti-inflammatory for the lungs. And in fact, a lot of studies were done in Romania, because we in Romania, we have a lot of salt mines. Mm. And so doctors noticed that people that work in salt mines had significantly better health than people that worked in other kinds of mines, obviously coal mines, we know why, but even other mines. And so they started doing some research into like, well, could be living in a salt environment actually be helpful. Another interesting finding was by a German doctor during World War II, noticed that People who escaped the bombing and hid in salt caves had overall better uh, lung health than people who escaped on abandoned buildings or other measurement during the bombing of World War II. Again, putting the salt situation. So now that's one of the premises of why a lot of these salt rooms have opened around town and around the country because of the benefits that were noted during those, those time periods. I know a lot of those research studies on salt and I love them. I think they're fabulous. And in fact, yesterday, a friend of mine called and was like, my two-year-old can just not get over this cough. And I was like, take her to the salt cave because we have a salt cave nearby us. I said, sit in there for an hour. You'll be amazed. And today she texted like, oh my gosh, she's doing so much better. So yeah, it's amazing what salt can do. It's a, t- you know, it's a little secret. It's like, you know, I'll, you know, my practice now, look, I'm in a like 1935 house, you know, all the advice is like what grandmas used to give, you know, yeah, we're like exactly. about the honey and about the lemon and now go to salt, you know? It's so it, true it though. So, so true. Yep. Okay. So let's talk about preventing these colds or these coughs, because I feel like there's some people that their kids just get colds over and over and over all winter long. So are there some things that we can do to prevent colds and coughs? Well, the first thing, which nobody's going to be happy that I'm saying this right before the holidays or during the holidays is decreasing our sugar intake. I know, I know, I know. (laughs) I'm the fun police. I know. But the amount of sugar that we are eating during the holidays and we give ourselves permission to is actually depleting our immune system. 100 grams of sugar in one sitting will depress, will decrease your immune system from working for up to five hours. A hundred grams of sugar is one bottle of Coke, is a piece of cake, is a bag of Skittles. So it's not, it sounds like a hundred grams, like, oh, so no. So having that in one sitting at a birthday party is, and you know, what happens after birthday parties, 50 to 75% of kids go home end up within a couple of days having colds and sicknesses. And everybody's like, oh, because they went to the germy place. It's not the germy place. And it's not, you know, stop blaming the places. And we got to stop blaming the other kids too. Like, oh, all these kids have snot. I'm like, you invite the same people from the school and your neighborhood and your cousins that <laughs> you hang out with all the time. So True. they're not anything different. What the difference is that what do we serve at birthday parties? Cake, pizza, juice, soda, Gatorade. We give them takeaway candies. So it's like a sugar free for all because we want kids to have fun because we've associated in our culture that the only way to have fun is to eat sugar. And when you don't give your children sugar, then you're just a mean person. (laughs) I'm like, no, wait, hold on. But medically speaking, we are doing our children a disservice, especially this time of the year, because as we discussed, cold and flu is here. And now we're giving them a known immune system depressant. We talked about washing our hands, obviously, and covering our mouths and teaching your kids how to cover their coughs, et cetera. And we've got to bring fruits and vegetables into their diet. You know, one of the things I talk about is plant points in trying to get as many kids and as many adults to eat the plethora of plants. Because I'm not saying you have to be vegan. I'm not saying that you can't have meat. All I'm saying is that mother nature has provided us with multivitamins, if you will, in all the plants in the world. The reason they're all different colors is because they have different minerals and vitamins. That's why you eat a red pepper and a yellow pepper and a green pepper and orange pepper. Those are four plant points because each one of them has their own different micronutrients that are good for the system. And a lot of people reach for vitamin C during cold and flu season instead of a red pepper. Red pepper is more, it's higher in vitamin C than an orange. And guava is actually the highest 
fruit, the highest vitamin C containing fruit, who knew? The other thing people go, let me get vitamin D, which I love vitamin D, but you know, sardines are the highest food, highest vitamin D containing food that also contains omega-3s and also contains vitamin A, which is another multivitamin with the least amount of mercury and that we can have it instead of having, so food, looking at food, again, I started with plants and I end up with sardines because I always, <laughs> you know, well, and I'm laughing right now because I'm like, I'm all on board with you with the fruits and vegetables. In fact, we do the 10 plant points. I learned that from you and I talk about it, but then all these people are like, thanks to Just Ingredients, we do the 10 plant points. And I want to say, no, thanks to Dr. Anna Maria Temple, you do the 10 plant points. But anyways, that's a little tangent. Okay. I'm, I'm totally on board with you for the plant points. The fruits and vegetables are amazing. Sardines, getting kids to eat sardines. <laughs> I'm laughing. I'm like, that's not happening in my house. I don't know how to hide those well enough. So, you know, um, well, usually what I do, I start babies and that's one of the first foods. Everyone's like, what are first foods in your clinic? As I like, plants and then babies have to do a lot of plant points and then sardines, sardines and oysters. Sardines are the vitamin D, omega-3, vitamin A and oysters are zinc. And those, if we get kids eating from an early age, their taste buds adjust, their uh, preferences adjust to that. But in older kids, if your kids were to eat a tuna salad, you can take a tiny piece of sardine and smush it in their tuna salad because tuna is fishy. It's not a white fish, right? It's fishy. And they won't be able to, like, don't open a can of sardines and be like, here, kids, eat all the <laughs> dead fish in a can, because <laughs> that's not going to happen. If you cut it up and present it slowly, or you mix it into other dishes so they can begin to adjust to the fishy flavor slowly, it is an acquired taste, especially if you don't like strong fish. Okay, well, I'll mix a little into the tuna and I'll report back to you on how that goes. <laughs> Okay, but let's talk about supplements while kids have the flu or the cold or a cough. Do you recommend any supplements or just focus on the food or both? I do both because when you're um, feeling unwell, you need vitamin D and you need it in much higher quantities than you can get it from food and much higher quantities than you can get it from sun, especially in the winter time. Another reason that we have cold and flu in the winter is we have lack of vitamin D because our sun, depending on where you are in the world, for most people, the sun is, you, we're not having as much sunshine. We're not outside as much. It's cold. We're covered up. So our levels of vitamin D go down with the season. So that's another reason we have cold and flu issues in a specific time of the year. So vitamin D I do give, and I prefer liquid in oil because it helps the absorption rather than capsules. I know the adults are going to do capsules. That's fine. I'm just saying I'm giving you the ideal vitamin C in a liposomal format. Liposomal vitamin C is vitamin C that is wrapped around with a fat, which helps you absorb it better. Otherwise you just pee it out. Probiotics are fabulous. That is extra um, fighting power because 60 to 80% of our immune system lies in our gut. So by adding a good probiotic, you will help to add extra army to your immune system that lies in your gut. Omega-3s are essential fatty acids that are anti-inflammatory. And when we go into and the virus and the flu is attacking us, we get inflamed. So omega-3 kind of puts out the fire, if you will, like quote unquote water. Zinc is another very powerful immune system building micronutrient. Now, a lot of people are like, oh my God, vitamin D, C, zinc, I should get a multivitamin. My issue with multivitamins is that they have tiny, tiny amounts. So example, when your child who's two, as an example, is going through a cold, if you give them a multivitamin, it's going to be maybe 400 international units of vitamin D. For a cold, your two-year-old might need 1,000 to 2,000 international units of vitamin D. You cannot get that from a multivitamin, and you can't double up or triple up the dose of the multivitamin because then you give them too much vitamin A or too much B12, and you can make them sicker. When you do zinc for a two-year-old, the dose is 7.5 milligrams when you're dealing with a cold. In a multivitamin, it's about two milligrams. So you start to see like how it's not really going to match up. So I'm very much like we get our vitamins from food on a regular basis. And when we're sick, we're going to add some supplements. Or if you want to prevent, you add some supplements very specifically like the D C, zinc, omegas, and probiotics in order to support the immune system a little bit extra during the cold and flu season. I love that. People ask me all the time, like, do you give all of these supplements like every day? And 
in my house, this is how we do it. We focus on the fruits and vegetables, but if anyone becomes sick in the house, they get the supplements and everybody else, because I don't want anybody else getting what they have come down with. And so it just seems to like nip it in the bud and no one else gets it. I do exactly the same thing. Exactly the same. Okay. Talking about colds, we've talked about like the coughs, but what about the congestion? Because that's always an issue too with colds. So I'm sure you have some tips on what to do with congestion. Oh, the old snot. You know, is that <laughs> you can't be a pediatrician if you don't just know a lot about snot. Um, the boogers. So with the congestion, one of the things that I use, uh, again, why do we get snot? So I want to talk about the snot because another popular misconception is, oh my gosh, we are at a sinus infection. If you have congestion, you immediately have sinus infection. Snot. So when virus comes in and, and enters our nose, the way our immune system comes to the surface, to the, you know, the mucosal mem membranes, the edge of the nose, and then it starts making you make a lot of snot. The snot is initially tons of it and it's clear and it's pouring out and that is to wash out the viruses. So it's not that the virus is doing anything. It's that's the immune system trying to wash out the virus. And so in the first few days of a cold, your nose is continuously drippy. You get like that little tiny drip and use a thousand tissues and your nose is raw, but you haven't actually blown your nose. As time progresses, more and more snot gets produced. Now, the day three through five, it can start getting a little bit thicker and right about day five starts turning yellow, which then people are like, aha, you've had cold for five days. Now your snot is yellow. Therefore, you becoming have a uh, sinus infection. No, no. When the, you're in the healing phase, the body is no longer making as much snot. So it's all that's coming out of your nose. It's actually the body's absorbing the extra water and you have a yellow fluid left behind, but that's because it's not as watery. The body is just pulling back some of the water. And then by day five, six, or seven, the snot starts turning green, which all that means it's dead bacteria and dead white blood cells and dead tissue. The true color of snot is green. It's when we, but all that extra water makes it clear. Then as it thickens, it's yellow. And then when it's really thick, because the body is absorbing most of the water now, it's green. It does, green does not mean a sinus infection. That is something that us doctors have put out in the environment because like, oh my God, you have snot. What color is your snot? How long has your snot been going on? Is it green? Wow, it's green. And then we, we've made it important when it's really not. Green most of the time is in the healing phase. It should attract everyone's attention. I should irrigate my nose more aggressively because when it gets thick and green, it can get stuck in the sinuses and then cause bacteria to jump in there and cause a sinus infection. Hmm. Majority of sinus infections, like 80 to 90% do not need antibiotics. They just need a good old saline rinse and all the other stuff that we just talked about, those supplements and some salt room, but they need a good irrigation. So we keep the snot flowing clear because the body will take care of business. My daughter came from college. She's like, I have a sinus infection. I was like, I've literally just did a reel on this. You do <laughs> not have sinus infection. And so we did operation like blast her face with saline spray. It's a joy living with me. And then elderberry syrup came out. I oscillococcinum because there was reports of flu, the vitamin D and zinc. She had to do her concoctions every day. And within 48 hours, she turned around fine and we didn't actually ended up needing any antibiotics, but in her mind, she's like, I've been sick for a week. Here we go. So, but that's a very common thing I hear from people. So color is not as, not as important as you think it is. It just tells you let's irrigate. Now, my favorite trick that has been on reels is the wet sock method. Oh yeah. And I saw that on a reel the other day. Didn't you do it on a reel? No, it's not dead. yeah. I made my son. Yeah, I tortured my son with that too. He was yeah. congested. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Tell my listeners about it. <laughs> so the wet sock method, also old school, also comes from a Russian doctor that noticed that it was like in the 1950s that noticed that his patients, uh, when they're getting sick, his treatment was like uh, putting feet in ice cold bath for 15 seconds and then put in warm bath and cold bath and alternating it. And he showed that uh, the colds, the way people were able to get over their colds sooner. Then other people did some studies where they put people who had colds, they gave them actual infections, they gave them bacterial infections. And one group was in a local regular showers and the other group was in a hot shower 
followed by a 30, 60 or 90 second cold shower. And what they noticed that the people that did the cold showers were able to have less symptoms during the illness and got over their illnesses faster than people that just did a regular bath. They repeated a similar one with just foot baths and showed the same thing. So the wet sock method comes from those. And what it is, is your child has to be in a hot bath. You can do this on little babies. Obviously it can't be too hot for little babies. In my older kids, I want them sweating. I'm obviously near them. So they're not, and they have hydration, but I want them sweating, dripping with sweat for about five to 10 minutes. Cause that's very detoxifying. Then they come out of the bath when they're still sweating. And I take a thin pair of cotton socks. It's immersed in ice cold water for like five minutes while they're in the tub. I wring them out and put the cold socks on their feet. And then I take dry cotton socks and put them on top of that, put jammies on, throw them in bed gently, of course, and put them to bed for the night. And they wear the socks all night long. In the morning, everything is dry. And their congestion is so much better. Sometimes you have to do it two or three nights in a row. But within the first night, you will notice a huge improvement because what happens, the lymphatic drainage that is in our face, in our throat, throughout our body, doesn't have any valves. It's just in gravity pulls everything down. When we do hot, it vasodilates, so the vessels open up. When we do cold, it constricts, so vasoconstricts. So the opening and closing causes a pump-like effect that helps the lymphatic system drain. And the other thing is that immersion in cold water or in the cold socks produces cytokines, which are inflammatory cells, which are very good. They got a bad rap with COVID. Cytokines are very good because they heal. So you produce enough cytokines. In other words, you stir up the immune system to go to the area of infection and help get rid of the congestion. I love that a doctor is talking about this because 15 years ago, um, the doctor was that was helping me heal from my depression actually taught me this because I had come down with a cold. And my husband was like, you are doing what? Like, this is voodoo. Like, this is the craziest thing, but it worked. And so ever since I've done that for years for kids with colds, when I've had a cold, something like that. And so I love that you're explaining the science behind it. So I just want to tell my listeners, it does really work. That it totally works. And I did it because I was doing it. Everybody's like, where's the science? I'm like, hold on. If you look at wet sock method science, you find nothing. But if you do cold immersion, so much stuff comes out. In fact, now in our town, you have places called I cryo that you go into this room, which I went in, by the way, when I had a cold last, I almost, I thought I was going to die. And they put you almost naked in this room and they lower your body temperature by the outside body temperature by like 30 degrees when they shoot this cold air at you in order to stimulate the nervous system. It helps stimulate serotonin for depression and it helps stimulate the cytokines for infections. Right. We have those places by us as well. Really quick though, I want to talk about congestion growing up. Well, I mean, when I had little kids, everybody said green snot meant infection. And I know today pediatricians still just pass out those antibiotics as soon as they see green snot. If you call in and say, oh, the snot has turned to green, they immediately, oh, here's an antibiotic. So I love that you're teaching parents, don't freak out. It's okay. That's just the dry bo- boogers. boogers. Yeah. Dry boogers. <laughs> okay. So like a neti pod would actually work great in that case. That's amazing. I, most kids can't do a neti pod. I'll tell you my favorite neti pod substitution is a saline can. If you go to any of your local grocery store or pharmacies, there's a can of saline. It looks like a giant can. It has a spout on it and you shoot it up the child's nose and you have them turn their head. It does the same thing as a neti pod, but you don't have to do the, you know, the teapot looking thing. And now it's in their eye and now everyone's crying. (laughs) You got to mix stuff. The saline can is amazing. It just like shoots up. You just have to have an old enough child that can do the head turn because it does help when you bring the saline to the other side, it helps bring the snot out of the sinuses a little bit deeper. Okay. Good to know. That's a good tip. All right. I want to ask you about one last illness that we see a lot during the winter and that is ear infections. And again, When I would take my little kids in, if you have an ear infection, they would just prescribe the antibiotic, but that's not necessarily what they need, right? 80% of ear infections do not require antibiotics. And this is in kids six months and older, you know, and I hear this all the time that, you know, when you go to the doctor and they're like, oh my gosh, the ear's red 
or there's a little bit of clear fluid, that means that, or there's a little bit of pus that's an infection, let's do antibiotics. I will tell you, when I was seeing patients every 10 minutes and they had been waiting in my waiting room for 45 minutes, the child is screaming, everyone has you know, lost their, their mind by the time they see me and the mom has to go to work. It, it was easier to write an antibiotic than to explain. And when I learned that 80% of your infections did not need to be treated with antibiotics, I would make prejudgments. I'm just, you know, I'm a fully transparent person. And I person will come in. I was like, that mom is definitely going to win antibiotics. Why am I going to waste my time telling her about this? But I'm like, and then my other self would be like, that is just doing a disservice to the people. You need to tell her. And then I would go into my, okay, my whole spiel on the ear infections. And 99% of the time, people were like, what? We don't need antibiotics. That's fantastic news. Or oh, we can wait for 48 hours. That's great. So as long as you have some pain relieving methods and some ways to keep the children comfortable, most parents are going to be okay with not giving their children antibiotics, but you can't just say, wait for 48 hours. Good luck to you. That's not going to work. So we don't need antibiotics right away. So what, what can you do? We want to decongest the nose. We just talked about the saline. We talked about the wet sock method, the saline nose spray. There's another saline nose spray that has xylitol and grapefruit seed extract that is amazing to use. That's antibacterial. You can talk to your doctor about other decongestant nose sprays that you can use, but only with a doctor's supervision. The salt rooms that we talked about for pain management using garlic oil drops is amazing. It will really help decongest pain from ear infections. I have a lot of patients who use onions and I'm not well versed in the onion method, but there's a whole onion method going around that I need to spend a little more time on. And if your child cannot sleep, they're miserable, it is okay to do a Motrin. I prefer the ibuprofen to the acetaminophen if you need it in the 48 hours while, because that's an anti-inflammatory that will help the eustachian tube drain, that will help the, deconge the congestion drain, make them more comfortable. And then you could wait for 48 hours before starting an antibiotic. I love those tips. So there also is a homeopathic eardrop that I swear by because when my kids would be like, oh, my ears hurt, I put that in and it would just clear things up and be amazing. That's awesome. What is the name of it? Uh, it's from Highlands. Oh, hi. Okay. Got it. And yeah. another thing, if you have a craniosacral therapist in your town, craniosacral therapy is not chiropractic. They do a very specific way of decongesting your sinuses. So if you have a sin, you think you have a sinus infection, see them. If you your child is in your infection, that's where my patients go when it's looking hideous in there. I send them to a craniosacral therapist and they usually are help, very helpful in declogging the eustachian tubes. Oh, that's good to know. And I know some people have talked about certain massages that work as well. Yeah. And that's in the craniosacral therapy. You could actually Google that online too. And figure out how to do the massage. You could try. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you could try. Okay. I said one last topic, but I actually have one more. I just want to pick your brain on really quick. Sore throats. Cause that's another huge one during the cold and flu season. And in fact, my kids just had sore throats the other day. So what do you recommend for sore throats? Um, I love the honey. Honey for sore throats coats so nicely. I'm telling you that propolis spray is like mind blowing good. So it's from a honey, it's from the hive. And that's all it is in the spray is just propolis from the beehive. That is so incredibly soothing to the back of the throat. If you have other things, anything cold, popsicles, icicles, of course, without food coloring and sugar, but you can turn anything, anything cold is very soothing to the back of the throat can do a salt gargle. None of my patients will do it. So I, I give that kind of an average because my patients won't do it. But I would say the honey is my winner um, every single time. Honey and the propolis spray. I love those tips. I made my teenagers do the garlic. I mean, the garlic, the salt wash. And it actually seemed to help quite a bit. So it works. And it's just, what, mom, don't do it. what about pineapple? Pineapple juice. <sighs> Pineapple is great. It's a digestive enzyme. Um, it comes with mixed reviews and some people do good. And then some people makes their tongue feel really weird because it starts testing their taste buds. So, I mean, if you, if your child, again, it, different things are fit for different people. Pineapple juice is a lovely option for some people. Thank you so much for being here today. What last tip can you give these parents that would be calming to them, I guess I should say, during the flu and cold season? The human body knows what to do. We just have to give it the right tools and healing happens. 
you know, we often talk about cure. Cure is like, okay, I have this thing and I take this pill and then it never comes back. Healing is so that curing is some from the outside. Healing is the body's doing it from the inside. We have been around, humanity has been around for thousands of years. Viruses, bacteria, parasites, fungi have been around for thousands of years. We've been able to overcome it. So I'm always just, I always tell my parents, the reason that, you know, we do our plant points and we drink our water and we watch our sugar and we eat, watch our processed foods is so we are best prepared for when in cold and flu season comes, we're not going to lose sleep at nighttime because we know our body's going to know what to do. So think more natural. And then whenever there is a, your child has an illness and your doctor says, here's a pill, just ask, is there a natural option before we go to the pill? I understand sometimes we need antibiotics. Sometimes we need steroids. Sometimes we need medications, but what else can we do before we rely on those things? I love that advice. And I just want to testify to that because when I did not live a healthy lifestyle, I feel like we took our kids all the time to pediatricians during the cold and flu season for all these different illnesses. And since we've been living a healthy lifestyle, I honestly, if I'm thinking back like in the past 15 years, I have maybe taken my kids once, maybe twice in those 15 years for a sick visit. Otherwise, we've just been healthy through the winters. So it comes down to that food and good sleep and water and exercise and things like that. Yeah, it's true. And that's why we, that's what I talk about in clinic all the time. You know, we, this is where we spend our time, but you can't be in a 10 minute, you know, I have hour appointments, but I, I call it, I torture all my families with all this because now when we have a pandemic, when we have the stuff that's coming through the, our families are doing great. They're doing fine. Their immune systems are kicking booty. Right. I hope every parent out there that follows me listens to this episode because I know they will learn so much about how to help their kids and tell my listeners where they can best find you. I'd love to help you guys on Instagram. I do tons of free education at D-R-A-N-A Maria Temple. I have a YouTube channel with the same exact name. That's where I go grocery shopping at Costco, Walmart, and Target to show you how to feed your family better with less ingredients and more nutrition. And um, for you guys today, um, for being honored to be in, on, on this podcast, I have my holistic pediatrics manual for your common childhood illnesses from A to Z with all kinds of natural solutions. We're doing a discount that doesn't happen and but it's only for um you guys for listening as a thank you for listening and to help you keep your children well during this cold and flu season thank you so much we'll put that discount in the show notes for those that are listening and also you guys go follow her you honestly are like my top person to follow i love watching your reels your info just because it's so doable it's not this crazy stuff it's very doable so thank you for everything that you're teaching out there I end my podcast with always asking my guests what they have found to be the best ingredient in life. What would you say it is? Today, my best ingredient is my mindset. I've realized that when I have changed my mindset, as I discussed when my children were sick, amazing things have happened. And every single day when life gets tough, I just have a moment and a discussion on how I'm gonna approach the day. And my mindset towards my children's wellness, towards my followers, towards everyone that I work with changes and great things happen. I love that so much. It is so true. It's your mindset as to whether it's going to be a good day or a bad day. And if you're going to get through your kid's illness with a positive attitude and help them heal, or if you're not going to. So, so true. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Anna Maria Temple for being here today. I really appreciate all the education you just gave my listeners. And I really appreciate all the education that you give on your social media sites. Thank you so much for having me. And I've shared the same compliments because I'm slightly stockish on your account as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to subscribe to the Just Ingredients podcast to learn more about your health and good ingredients to life. Plus, get daily tips at just.ingredients on Instagram. <laughs>